Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. My guest this week is Joseph Todorovich. Joseph is a figurative painter from Southern California. He's an accomplished draftsman and painter. Joseph teaches figure and drawing and painting lessons from his studio in the historic downtown Pomona. In this episode, Joseph and I talk about making beautiful lines and the beauty of being absolutely present and attentive while drawing. Joseph considers himself a perpetual student. We talk about the concept of maintaining the student mindset, and he reminded me of a quote by the Japanese master, Katsushika Hokusai, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. This quote by Hokusai was something that was read to me in college as well, and I had completely forgotten about it. So I had to look it up and read it so that I can share it with you too, because it is fantastic. After sharing a story about seeing a drawing in the halls of his alma mater at Cal State Fullerton, Joseph shares his thoughts on what makes a good draftsman. We talk about the simple eloquence that comes from the simplest of tools, which is just plain old burnt wood or charcoal and paper. Joseph is currently preparing for a solo show at Maxwell Alexander Gallery in Los Angeles later this year. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Joseph Todorovich. Joseph, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you and I'm really grateful for the time that you're spending with me. Well, likewise, I I appreciate you considering me and uh, I'm excited too. I would love for you to sort of give us a background on when you started painting. Um, what made you decide to become an artist? Well, I I've uh, I started painting at kind of when I was a kid, when I'd just be visiting my grandma's. She was nice enough to kind of show me and and let me play with all the stuff that she had in her in her special place with all her hobby stuff, and she was always always willing to do crafts and arts and things like that. So. It started pretty early, I guess, but I didn't really know it was what I wanted to do until we started doing it in school, and that was the funnest time for me. I guess it was art time, coloring and you know, doing visual projects, things like that, watching movies, going on field trips, being out and about. That, that was like the funnest stuff for me. So I started to say, hey, this is, this is what interests me the most. Or, well, I guess I didn't even notice. I just, that's when I found myself happiest mm. doing those things. So probably around then I, I, I kind of started to put the, put the pieces together. When did you commit to art as your primary vocation? Yeah. Uh, okay. So I would say in junior high and high school, I started to see my peers acknowledge what I was doing and, you know, a little bit of my ability and and that kind of got me a little more social capital, I guess. So that was encouraging, you know, to my spirit, you know, yeah. and, and I and I really enjoy doing it. So, you know, I push for more and, and then I, I'm pretty competitive at heart. So I, I always wanted to be better than anyone who I thought was doing what I was doing. I guess it would be around that time I, I decided this is what I'm good at and this is what makes me happy doing. And can I do this as a job? started thinking about that. Did you have anybody that you could talk to that that did it as a job that sort of helped you out? No, I I can't say that I can't say that I did. Although my dad is a painter by trade, he he paints cars, Mm -hmm. you know, so I grew up around him doing paint jobs every weekend, custom jobs at home in the side yard, but he, you know, worked at an auto body shop. And so I kind of grew up around him striping cars and designing paint jobs on, on like custom cars on the weekend with my brother. We'd be around the, the pinstripe guy, Bobby Kazi would come over and, you know, stripe the cars and my dad's done painting them. And it was this whole kind of, you know, garage afternoon weekend event that was pretty common growing up. So I was always into, uh, always around like color. Yeah. The idea of paint. And I guess the creative process. I didn't really think much of it at the time, but that's probably the first introduction. And I, I was pretty, pretty much my whole life. I was around that. So. Very cool. Who were some of the artists that you, you started to notice that inspired you? Well, I probably, I guess in high school, I, my first art teacher, Mrs. Ritchie. <laughs> Where was that? That was at Eisenhower high school in Rialto, uh-huh. California. 
Yeah, it was great. I was so excited to get in that class and, and she was just so nurturing and so much fun and open and like, you know, she let me do whatever I wanted in there pretty much. And as long as I was, you know, doing something and, and, and making a project and fulfilling the project and she could tell I was trying to go over and above and exceed the project itself. And I always had ideas. So she would show me her sketchbooks and she had a lot of pencil drawings, a lot of graphite drawings that were, that I respected and that I acknowledged like, wow, that's, you know, it's really good. So she was probably the first one. And then after that it was college and then everything changed right about right, right then I realized this is a whole world and it, it, it kind of opened up. Wow. So what did that feel like to you? Cause I kind of remember what that was like when you, you have this, tiny little vision, you have this small little world that you existed in as an artist. And then all of a sudden, you realize like, this thing is, there's lots of people out there doing it. And there's a lot to learn. Yeah, it was really special. I mean, in high school, I had developed my own, my own thing. And so, you know, I made it pretty clear to my parents, I'm going to school for art. That's it. That's the way it's going to be. They were very supportive. And when I got to college, I thought I, you know, I knew everything, you know, at least about, <laughs> at least about my design sensibility and what I wanted to say about, you know, say through my art. I mean, uh -huh. I knew it all, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I did too, by the way. That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and then, you know, I started seeing real drawings in the halls in college and, and I, my jaw dropped and I, and I recognized immediately that they were speaking a language that I, I just wasn't quite privy to. And it was one moment seeing one particular figure drawing that it was so clearly articulated and thorough and the statement was so, I mean, it was just so impactful. I, I realized immediately that I wasn't working on those terms. Mm -hmm. I was at that time, I guess, for a comparison, I was working really two-dimensionally, you know, mm. just designing shapes and making up shapes that I thought were interesting and so forth. But I had no, I had no understanding of draftsmanship. And my three-dimensionality was very primitive or, or I guess, <laughs> in, in, in its infant stage, I would say. Yeah, yeah. For someone as competitive as you are, what did that feel like? What did you do? Well, it, it was exciting because I knew that I was going to school to learn that. So I was going to be exposed and I was, I was just so ready to hear what this is all about. And I knew that there was that there was curriculum involved because these were just sketches. These were assignments, like obviously there were figure drawings from just from a course and that this was what the course was all about. They were just they were in display cases about what they were focusing on. So I wasn't upset or anything like that. I was just like, wow, this is where I when do I get in that class? Bring it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And where was this? I'm sorry. This was at Cal State Fullerton in uh, California. Uh huh. They have a great, I know a lot of really good artists that came out of Cal State Fullerton. Yeah, I mean, their program was, is, was really exciting and local. So mm -hmm. it, was within, it was within my range. And so I was ready. It was fun. So give me a snapshot of after, after college. What did you do? So like after, I mean, because it's always, college is so wonderful because you can just, your job is basically just learn how to draw, learn how to paint, learn how to be a good artist. And you don't have to worry about anything else other than learning that. And then you get out and it's on, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious about uh, what was your experience when you graduated? What were you like, what were you thinking and what did you do? Well, I I'd say also that when I was in college, about halfway through, I started to learn a lot about other ateliers in LA that are outside. There were smaller schools where you know, we were we were studying from some of the teachers' videos from those schools in our class at at the college because it, the the program was you know was not as developed as things are today. I mean, that was most twenty years ago. So it, we're just kind of scratching the surface. And representational art, in 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 my estimation, was was not as uh, rampant as it is now. But I developed in college and getting out of college this understanding that uh, I'm a perpetual student and. I'm just going to be in a constant learning mode. And some of the, like, I started going to these ateliers outside of class while I was still in college mm -hmm. and studying with some individuals who were, who were teaching. And, and I learned really quickly that this is a, a long, this is a marathon idea. Mm -hmm. And it takes a long time to kind of really 
first get proficient and then and then get command over these ideas and these you know this very long esteemed tradition so when i got out of college i wasn't really things didn't really change too much i was already on that path of just acknowledging that learning was my career mm-hmm. and so that kind of opened up the doors to t- take more more classes individually in the atelier format which is what i really wanted to be doing with most of my time and just practice just painting for painting and drawing from life. well drawing from life mostly i wasn't for five years, it, it was mostly a drawing curriculum because most of the instructors were, were animation instructors or what the teaching was geared towards animation, not necessarily painting or mm. illustration. So it was kind of this idea, this new idea of draftsmanship, mm. you know, being a good draftsman, understanding how to construct the form and maintain the spirit of, of the figure or the object, the subject that you're trying to draw. And so, yeah, I, I just... I was in learning mode Mm. out of college and kind of stayed there for a while. Yeah. It's, I mean, if you can, when you can stay there forever, it's wonderful. You know, like if you can always maintain, no matter how much you are able to learn, there's always more to learn. And so that idea that it is a marathon, like you said, and that you don't reach, it's almost like you're never going to reach sounds awful to say that, but it, you know, to me, it's exciting <laughs> that you're never going to reach this, this pinnacle. Well, it, as, as you say that, you know, one of the teachers I, I had the privilege to study with was Glenn Vilpu, who mm-hmm. was a well-known, you know, instructor. And he used to read this quote, this old Hokusai quote. And I always tell people about it. I even bought my grandmother the book because I, you know, she kind of set me on this path. That's the hundred hundred paintings of of Mount Fuji. Is am I remembering it right, or do I have it completely wrong? The book. Are you asking about the book? Yeah, it's this really large coffee table book. It has the wave on the front, I think, or something like that. I don't remember. Okay, it's, it's just this big, awesome book that uh, <laughs> I, I gave her. She probably put it in. It's probably collecting dust in the garage or something. <laughs> I don't know, but. But it was so meaningful to me because Glenn would read that quote in the beginning of class that Hokusai talks about and it goes some I always just paraphrase something to the effect that when I'm 20 uh, I'm an infant and when I'm in my 30s I'll be just scratching the surface when I'm in my 50s and he goes all the way to like when I'm in my 80s I'll just be understanding yeah and he goes to something like 120 when I'm in my hun- when I'm 130 everything I put everything I touch on the page will jump off the page with life and spirit and you know and, act, and all this kind of <laughs> all this kind of accuracy and it's just this beautiful and like he always got this tear in his eye glenn you know he, he kind of well i don't know if he still reads the quote today that was you know 20 years ago or whatever but when he read it it, it was magnificent it just it just like this idea of mastery kind of uh, overcame me and it was just i just thought it was the coolest thing you know yeah and i felt so privileged just to be able to do and be where i was at it was so yeah Oh my God. Yeah. I, I've forgotten about that quote. I know exactly. I'm going to look it up while we're talking. Oh yeah. oh yeah. I need to write it down somewhere <laughs> and stop paraphrasing it. I need to get it right. Yeah. So it says from, from around the age of six, I had the habit of sketching from life. I became an artist and from 50 on began producing works that won some reputation, but nothing I did before the age of 70 was worthy of is. attention. At 73, I began to grasp the structures of birds and beasts, insects and fish, and of the way plants grow. If I go on trying, I will surely understand them still better by the time I'm 86, so that by 90, I will have penetrated to their essential nature. At 100, I may well have a positively divine understanding of them, while at 130, (laughs) 40 or more, I will have reached the stage where every dot and every stroke I paint will be alive. Yes. Beautiful. I love that. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. Isn't that something? I mean, that's been the undercurrent of my spirit ever since that day. And (laughs) thank you for refreshing that for me. (laughs) Now I'm going to definitely have that up in up in golden quotes. You know, yeah, that's, that's the thing. Yeah. No, thank you for reminding me of that because I remember somebody reading that to me also in college and I totally for I have the book, his book, which is, you know, representative of, of that. It's the hundred drawings of Mount Fuji. A hundred paintings or hundred drawings of Mount Fuji. And I, I love I adore that book. I love it because it's just shows under no uncertain terms how you can 
become obsessed with even a single mountain and how many different ways you can portray that mountain. Not a single one of those is the same and they're all different. They're unique. And he does it from, you know, like the obvious standpoints, but from puddles and in reflections of windows and, you know, like all, it's just incredible. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's where I was coming from coming out of school and much to my family's dismay. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I suppose, but there was some ups and downs, but thankfully everyone is so supportive. I, I feel very privileged. Yeah. There's something, yeah, it is a privilege, I think, to be to be an artist because, well, first of all, it's just the best vocation there is out there, but I'm slightly biased. <laughs> but also, I mean, you know, in order to do it, you have to have, you can describe it in so many ways, but, you know, there's a certain amount of, of obvious passion and interest and, and intellect. And then there's this, you know, what some people have called this stubborn, irrational <laughs> desire to do this thing. But, yeah. you know, at, at another point, in order to be an artist, you, you sort of do have to have some certain basic things covered in your life. And yeah. like, I don't forget that, that there's a lot of people that it would just be impossible. A good support system is really, is really important and nurturing. Mm. I'm not sure if you can answer this question. It might be a very difficult question to answer. But you mentioned that you realized that you know, when you saw that one sketch in the hallway that you kind of felt like you understood what it might mean to be a good draftsman. What do you think makes a good draftsman? That's a good question. Gosh, well, a lot of things, not in any particular order. I I guess if I just free associate, it'd probably have to start out with something like coming from the right place and attempting something, attempting to represent something faithfully. And obviously having a, a lot of practice and exploration under your belt when you approach that, that attempt and, and, and even a lot of study. I think it's a, a culmination of learning why you're trying to represent something and what it means to you and I guess as a human being and to your spirit to do this particular thing and what's your intention to communicate. And then all, all of the wonderful natural studies that come along with trying to gain more understanding of the subject or the object that you're trying to portray faithfully and sincerely. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a, a paying homage to nature, I would argue. And being a good draftsman means that you've done your due diligence and you're absolutely present and giving 100% at that moment to achieve the perfect form of communication through your lens as a human being. So that's kind of what comes to mind. I'm sure like when I think back on it, I'm going to have a ton more things like Mm -hmm. you need, you need to know anatomy. You need to have, you need to know how, uh, how light works. You need to know some (laughs) physics about, you know, have a lot more disciplines of study and other forms of life, not just art and all of these other things to become a a really, truly good draftsman and, and live a good life, hopefully. Mm. is in there as well. I I don't know. I guess that comes to mind. I, I don't have enough time and trees to answer that question. <laughs> we need a couple more hours. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm still f- trying to figure it out myself. But so far, those are some of the things that come to mind immediately. Hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to ask you again when we're both like 120 or 130 years old. <laughs> yeah. Call you up or whatever we're doing in, in 100 years. <laughs> like, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> I might say something like, you need to be able to see. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and have a little bit of energy left, you know? Just the, yeah. And even just the, God, knowing how hard to push on the, the you know, like just the simple mechanical things, the, the weight and the angle of that is when I see people who, who understand just that piece and, and all the other things that you talk about, it is breathtaking. And there's so much history. Like you can't, I can't. I should speak for myself. I can't look at a really good draftsman and not be aware of all the artists, all the history that comes before that, that sort of contributed to making that drawing. And I think if there's any medium where that comes out powerfully, I feel like it's charcoal and paper. (laughs) It's true. It's true. Burnt wood and and compressed wood and the most primitive materials, you know, and, and some of the most meaningful forms of communication. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it's true. 
it's poetry. I think you can't, you can't hide it. There's no distraction in it. I don't think you see the hand for sure. Yeah. And like you said, that all that cumulative knowledge that we've all kind of through our study kind of are exposed to, and it kind of develops our lexicon of tools. It's, it's all there and you can, and you can kind of read it, Mm. you know, you can really read it. And I think that's what I saw in the hallway that day is I felt like I was looking at a language that I, I, I didn't really understand and I just thought it was beautiful and and I wanted to learn it. It was so clear and so eloquent and I could see the clarity of this language and I was like, wow, I, I do not speak that language and I knew it. Mm. And, you know, and it was Marshall, Marshall Vandruff, who I actually got stuck in his class, so to speak, because I was trying to get in another class that was supposed to be the one but I got stuck in Marshall's class, and that's where I learned so much. And he introduced me to the idea and the concept of draftsmanship and being a draftsman. And ever since then, I just I could never thank him enough for that exposure. So cool! It was just exactly what I needed. Exactly what I what I needed to hear at that time it was awesome. Mm. So you teach figure drawing out of your own studio now. So coming at it from that perspective. What are some of the things that you see people struggling with over and over again? And what are some of the things, or maybe a more interesting question is, what are some of the things that you just wish you could implant download. into their brain? Yes, download. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's the common thing. I wish I could just download it. Well, that would be too easy. It would. Yeah. But I think it has to do more with a, a thought process and a demeanor than any any given concept because it's that thought process and demeanor that helps us I think prepare ourselves for the concepts that are about that we're about to kind of deal with and then properly attempt and and work to understand them and you know it takes patience and it takes kind of a I think a slower pace than we're used to these days we want things to happen now and if I'm not learning fast enough then you then you're not a good enough teacher type of thing you know that's that's scary. Mm. Now, there is definitely an important ability to, to be very clear as an instructor and things of that nature so that you can expedite the information and, and articulate it clearly and not be vague. I think that's really important in conjunction with a student being ready to receive that information. So I think it'd have to do with something like a wherewithal or a, a, a particular um, demeanor comes to mind, but there's another word. Yeah, it's a it's a mindset, I think. It's a mental, you know, it's your mental constructs that you this is something that, you know, I've I talk about a lot, maybe not so much in detail in, on this podcast, but a lot kind of offline with this, is how much your mindset has to do with your ability to sustain your art. Because you Surely. It is that, it is that quote that you're in it for the long haul. This is not a slow, this is not like watch five videos and take one, take one drawing class with you. And then suddenly you're a master draftsman, you know, this is, it's a lifetime slow. And I hate to say it, but it is a slow, sometimes painful evolution. You know, that's the thing. It's not all that painful if you're present in the moment. It's kind of a beautiful Mm -hmm. journey. You're slowing down and looking at the ride. And yes, I wanted to get there. I wanted to be there right now back then when I was looking at that drawing, you know, but this much time goes by and, you know, you learn a lot and you get better and get a little bit closer. And yeah, it can be painful. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, you know, I think it helps us grow. I think there's something really valuable to it and to those types of endeavors that provide some, hopefully some kind of wisdom about life and what it means to be alive. Uh, I think yeah. that's my opinion. Yeah. You know, those types of endeavors are meaningful and we need more of that stuff in this day and age when it's so easy to try to get the quick fix, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just that, that idea of enjoying the process of when I think back to, and I, I studied fine art and illustration. I went to Art Center College of Design. And when I was there, the curriculum was basically at least the first six semesters were included probably three or four different life drawing or head drawing or whatever courses. 
and those were eight hours each. So it was, you know, it was extended drawing, but I feel like I am kind of an embryo in terms of being a draftsman because it's not something that you can do and then not do it for a long time. It's more like working out. It's not like riding a bike. It's more like working out. That was something Steve Houston was one of my instructors. And that was one thing he always said was that you have to keep it up. You can't stop and then expect to pick up right where you left off. And so because of that, I would say like, I'm kind of an embryo, like I got to a certain place and then moved on to other you know, to painting and to other things. But what where I was going with that, what I was going to say is what I remember most about it, you know, when I was really into it and, and more towards the end when I had a little, at least a little bit of proficiency is just the joy of wrapping a line around a contour and just that simple right. bit of just getting that exact. <laughs> Pulling that perfect ellipse around that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so satisfying and so yeah. incredible. So if I you can that. if you can put yourself into that mindset and really just enjoy that. Absolutely. Then, you know, you, you could do that forever. It's a gauge. I mean, it's right there when you get it just right, you're, you know, you're you're back on the track. You're back in your lane. It's like right where you need to be and and you know you're on the right path. I mean, it's it's self reassuring. It's it's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I think that's, you know, something that we start to lose when we start thinking too much about the outcome Mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, because, you know, what you're talking about is being present in this environment and really looking and really seeing and really experiencing that thing that's in front of you. And if you can have the presence of mind to take joy in every line like that, where it's it really it, like I I still re- I'm getting excited, you know I'm yeah. getting all like ee, right now because it. it's like <laughs> yeah. it it is so when you get there it's just so exciting and there's so much joy in just doing that and the rest of it doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a special thing. It's a special thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So now you know it's been 20 years since you you've been in school. You've been at this for for a long time. What are some of the more memorable responses you've had to your own work? Oh, gee, I, I never really I haven't given that much thought. <laughs> memorable responses. Well, positive responses are always reassuring. I we all like that. That's for sure. Negative responses can be good too. I suppose you know, kind of gets you thinking, shakes you up a bit, and makes you makes you uh, reassess and recalibrate and figure out how to respond to that in a good way, in a constructive way. Mm-hmm. Gosh, I can't, I can't say that anything really comes to mind specifically. I have, I've never got, you know, punched or anything like that or, <laughs> uh, or, or the opposite. You know, I've never have had too great of an encounter just based on my work being so fantastic. So I don't know, I guess I've had a lot of encouragement and just from a lot of people who I don't know. And I got to tell you, that's, that's a big deal. I mean, especially with like social media coming up kind of through my, my career from not having it to having it and seeing people from, you know, all these different places respond so positively. And even when myself, I, I can get tired of that really fast, the social media aspect of doing things with it, people still kind of say very encouraging things. And when they don't have to, mm-hmm. that's pretty cool. And I, I really appreciate that a lot. And it's very encouraging. So probably something like that mm-hmm. would be what comes to mind most. Yeah, I mean, it's that's interesting, because I think for artists in particular, it brings to the forefront this contradiction we have with wanting to be left alone, but needing attention. <laughs> Yeah. Like needing that, needing that yeah. validation, needing, needing the gold star on the refrigerator or, you know, somebody to tell you like, you're, you're doing good, keep going. But I mean, and I think that's, that's innate in us as human beings. I mean, when you're look at little kids and how they react when they draw a picture, the first thing they do is they hold it up and they want to show it to everybody. Certainly, certainly. Or when a little kid's doing their dance and at the family party, you know, everyone needs to stop and watch and acknowledge and give them that due respect at that moment. And I mean, it takes, it takes something to do that, you know, so it's a natural, it's a symbiotic relationship there, you know, it's important. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious. So 
related to that, but I'll tell you the reason that I'm asking this question before I ask it. And that is the comment I get most often from people is something along the lines of, wow, I didn't know other artists experienced that. And it's been, you know, it's just been amazingly impactful to hear that, you know, this artist experienced something similar and how they got through it. So with with that in mind, it's not supposed to be an Oprah moment where I'm trying to like dig in or anything. <laughs> but I'm curious, what are some of the challenges that you've struggled? And more importantly, how did you overcome that? Or, you know, whether it is the challenge of just making it month to month or actually creating the artwork? Yeah, I mean, I've had both throughout it all. The one that haunts me the most is is being creative and doing something meaningful. Sometimes it's it's really difficult to to understand what to paint. You know, here I am, I'm practicing, I'm practicing, I'm practicing, and I went down that rabbit hole. And when you do that, this subject is in front of you. It's okay, there's going to be a model tonight or a landscape or or whatever. And your your objective is to do it, do it well, do it proficiently. And then there you go. There's kind of a meaningful, attainable goal there or a, a gaugeable goal, I guess you could say. But when you're making artwork to make artwork and to compose and create to actually say something, you, you really have to have some life experiences that, that are meaningful enough to spend that kind of time on and really that you're committed to. And it's, it's easy to lose track. And when you start committing yourself to being a perpetual student, well, then you, you stop committing yourself to communicating about the things you see in nature and, and trying to faithfully represent something unique. That, that's just it. What I try to do is go back to that, go back to my life and figure out, you know, what story do I want to tell and what's really compelling to me. And my older, you know, as I get older and a little more chappy about life, you know, it's harder to commit to something that's so meaningful and deep enough to really paint. So it's very challenging. That's, that's the hardest thing. I tell people all the time, as, as we're learning how to paint, we should be learning about ourselves and what we want to say and what we want to paint. Because no one can teach you that. You have, to, you have to learn that on your own. So I try to stay present in life and, and try to stay perpetually appreciative of life. And so when moments come along, I'm, I'm there and I, I recognize it. I guess the problem with some of that is that when I'm recognizing something that I appreciate in life, I don't want to taint it with the making it, turning it into work and trying to get some reference or setting that up or hold on or making someone stop what they're doing or, <laughs> you know, because I want to live it. I want to experience it in its true form. I don't want to, I don't want to wreck it. So I've been learning more and more about how to kind of recreate that after the fact or it, stay present in the moment and take good mental notes or even physical notes and, and kind of record what it is I'm responding to and not just let it slip away because it can slip away like that, even if it's just a simple arrangement of shapes and values or this color next to that color in a particular arrangement can be perfect inspiration for a really epic painting. And learning to really be aware of that and, and is what I try to do in that nightmare because <laughs> it is. I, I've been through long periods of time where I just don't know and don't care about anything to paint. I just want to kind of, you know, so it, it, that's really hard. That's, that's really tough. When you're in that stage and you say you don't know and you don't care about what you want to paint, what are you doing instead? Gosh, that's a good question. Nothing constructive. <laughs> you know, that's for sure. Maybe even a little bit destructive, you know, and kind of just explore, you know, how kids test the boundaries and walk up to that line and do things like that. <laughs> walk up to the box and poke it or exactly. <laughs> like try to push it over. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I suppose that, but I, I do go, you know, I have, I have hobbies. Like I love being a person, being active, doing things, playing games, being around people, being social and things of that nature. And, and now, like I say, in my older days, my habits are getting more and more constructive and more wise, I could say, which is a, I'm very proud of or somewhat proud of. And uh -huh. So I'm doing more beneficial things, staying active, exercising more, trying to eat right, planning good meals with my wife and my family and doing, doing things like that that are just necessary. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. And they and they're important. They take they take time. Like, you know, I'm a pretty firm believer that you need to have all those important things in your life taken care of. Your family is important to you. You married your wife because you love her. So presumably you want to hang out with her and have fun with her and oh you know <laughs> all that stuff. So <laughs> she's the best. She's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, she's yeah, she's the reason and I'm still around. So yeah, she's she's really fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so all of that you have to be able to arrange time to be with her and not feeling like you should be painting and when you're painting, you don't want to be feeling like you're neglecting your wife, you know. Absolutely. I'm kind of curious based on what you just talked about and in terms of creating meaning for your work and those being some of the most important and challenging aspects of what you do. What have been some of the paintings that you've done that you are are most proud of that do have that meaning that you just look at it and you're like, that is special? Great question. That's a great question. I think of it as a two-pronged question, whereas there's paintings that are meaningful in a way it's like when I paint family members and so forth and do a good job at it, I'm really excited about those. And then there's just technical paintings that it, it could just be it doesn't have to be so sentimental. It could just be that technically I'm really proud of what I was able to achieve in that work. I, I guess I have a handful that I really stand behind. Most of them have to do with painting family members. I have, I have a wonderful, wonderful arrangement of nieces and, and a couple nephews. And they're so amazing and talented and, and beautiful and just loving and, and fun. And they're always willing to help me out and let me dress them up and take photos at the family gatherings. Oh, and, really? <laughs> yeah. You know, so we're doing things like that. And if I get a good one, it's it's super awesome. It's really hard to let them go. Those are typically the ones that I'm able to sell. And so, uh, unfortunately, we, you know, they're gone. But I'm just proud of that. That makes me happy. And then other ones, I guess, technically, I'm I'm trying to paint larger and I'm trying to utilize more of my skill set to compose and and to make a concert of a painting. I want to I talk about all this draftsman business and all this stuff I learn and so forth, but if you can't if you can't really pull out all the tools and build something special, you're really limiting yourself and that 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 kind of hurts in on the inside if I don't see that happening, you know, if I'm just staying in a comfortable zone or a mm. comfortable size or or even a comfortable subject, you know. And we do that. And I think that's fair, you know, and that's important, but it's also important to challenge. And I think that's where I'm at now. And I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to push the boundaries and use more of my skill set and learn more as well. Definitely. Because utilizing those things in concert raises so many new problems that need Mm. to be solved. And so technically that's for those paintings. I guess that's what I'm trying to do. So thinking about those paintings that you did of your nieces and your and your nephews, is there a painting that you've done that you would never give away or sell? Yeah, there's there's a couple I'd want back. Thankfully, one of them, well, two of them that that come to mind immediately are are nearby. I can visit, and I'm, I'm I consider myself good friends with the collectors. One lives out of state, but one lives here in California, and. I'm sure he'd let me visit whenever I want. In fact, he's let me borrow it for a show before, which was really generous and kind. And, mm. and you know, they, they have a, I thought I did something pretty special there technically with the, the subtlety and the execution was relatively there um, all together working pretty well. And, and just the overall feeling of the painting works worked really well in those two. Were they of your nieces and nephews? Is that the subject matter? Yeah. Yeah. My niece, Ryan, they're both of her, the two that come to mind. Although I've done, I've done of other nieces that are amazing too. That well, to me and to my family, that we really love. But those two are kind of recent. And the reason I picked the recent ones is because I think that I'm probably a little bit better technically as a painter for the recent ones than I am with kind of the the earlier ones that I did, kind of growing up. Even though, like, I really, gosh, there's a there's a handful back back then that I'd love to keep as well, but or have back. But yeah, you know, it's always about, you know, what your what frontier you're on right now, technically. And are you really, are you really kind of winning Mm. that battle? You know? Yeah. Are you still pushing yourself so much that 
you're able to do that where these paintings are continually just getting better and better and better and better. If you're still in the same place as you were 10 years ago, yeah, you've got some boundaries to push. <laughs> you sure, need to be poking certainly. that box. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Are there any habits that you have that you think have really contributed to your growth or your success as an artist? Well, these days I have to say exercise is one of them. It's really important. You know, you got to stay strong mm -hmm. because as soon as I think it's time to put down that brush and I, if I can get those extra three hours in, most of the time that's when the real magic happens. And I wake up the next morning and I go, holy cow, if I had stepped away, this would not have happened, this, this little gem of an idea or area. And I want to be able to do that. You know, I want to be able to continually push myself. That's important. So that's a big one. And when you're saying exercise, you mean physical exercise? Or are you yes. saying, ex okay. Yes. Staying healthy, eating well, exercising weekly and feeling strong, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not a... I'm not the strongest guy, but I want to keep my heart, my, I want to keep all my systems working really well. And I want to feel my best when I'm holding that brush, you know, mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like, it's just like any other field of expertise, what makes us different, you know, in that way, if you're an athlete or a doctor or whatever, you got to be on your best. And I think that's really important. Yes. And it has a, a massive impact on your, your mental clarity and vision and all that just in your mood too absolutely when i when i get that thing out out of the way in the morning that workout it's like i have already won the day so <laughs> anything that happens in the studio is just a cherry on top and i feel excellent you know and i i just it's really become very important to me so that's fantastic what do you do for a workout the last three years i've been doing some martial arts stuff with my good friend from childhood he's like a He's just this amazing martial artist. And I was doing that quite a bit for a while. I've slowed down on that. kind of Now I stick to my own routines and I have my own that keep me going. I do some cardio stuff and all that kind of, you know, yeah, all yeah, that kind of yeah. stuff. And as long as I get it in a few times a week, I, I feel like I'm doing my diligence and I'm doing the best by myself. Right, right. What advice would you give to artists who are just now starting out? Develop good work ethic and good work habits. Be careful with the materials. You know, it is toxic business, The uh, all the mineral spirits and all of the varnishes and so forth. Work in ventilated spaces. Like, we seem indestructible when we're younger. I know I certainly thought I was. And, you know, 10 years go by and you're, you've been exposed to that stuff or holding rags with that stuff, absorbing into your skin and things like that. It's a real consideration that you need to be aware of and and be careful about. And then good work ethic. I mean, put in those hours every day, whether it's actually at the easel or doing other things that are working towards your long-term goals. If it's administrative stuff you have to take care of and all of that, I mean, mm -hmm. you got to take care of that business and allocate the time for that and, and manage your time wisely. That's, that's what it comes down to. Cause you, you know, like you said, you can't be neglecting family and you need all those nurturing components and you need to put the work in and before you know it, the day's gone. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's a balancing act that, that needs to be practiced just the same as our draftsmanship, I would argue. I agree. I absolutely agree. It's so important and so easy to over, overlook. And when it's off balance, then... We know it. We know it when it's off balance. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know it, you know it, and everybody else knows it. And, yeah. you know, I mean, like, at the end of the day, art is so important to us. But like, we're here on this planet to enjoy ourselves and each other and losing sight of that and getting so crazy about anything, I think is just, it's not why we're here. <laughs> yeah, It's downright irresponsible. Gosh, darn it. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. cool. If you could own a piece of art by any living artist, what would it be or whose? Oh, gosh. Oh, any living artist? Mm -hmm. That's a good way to ask. That's a new spin on the question of who are you inspired by today yes. that's working. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Gosh, that's just such a hard question. There's so many great people. I know if I say somebody, I'm going to think of somebody else after. You know, it's not, it's not a big secret that, you know, one of my favorite painters is uh, Mr. Mr. Lipking. And he's done one of me that, you know, it's not, yeah, not that uh, I'm a great subject or anything like that, but I sure would like to have that painting, you know, it's a, that'd be nice to have in the, in the collection, but 
he comes to mind just because I, you know, I still don't have one and I thought I'd have one by now, but, <laughs> but, but gosh, there are so many painters out today who are just so darn good. And, you know, it's impossible. It's impossible for me to answer that question. I, I, I know, you know, I, I gave up, I gave up with that stuff and I'm so influenced by so many different things and so many different artists. I, I would love to have them all. And, and when I start thinking that way, I, I start to, I feel like I'm going down a, the wrong path. I feel like I should just kind of be an open sponge and let it all come from all directions. And yeah, I realistically am not, not quite the collector just yet. That's why I became an artist. If I can't buy them, I'll make my own type of thing, you know? So <laughs> we'll see when I, if I ever get to collector status, I have a few nice pieces in my collection, but I'll have to decide then when, when I put my money where my mouth is. Right, right. So, Joseph, do you have any shows coming up this year? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm working on a solo exhibition at for Maxwell Alexander Gallery. It'll be in the L.A. area and June for October. So I'm actually out ahead of schedule right now, so I'm pretty excited and hope to have some new-looking work in it and just working hard and really excited about it. Fantastic. I'm so impressed that you're ahead of schedule. That is amazing. Yeah, I'm usually behind, but yeah, I'm ahead this time. So things are looking up. Congratulations. I will definitely drive down for that one. Well, Joseph, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. It's been a lot of fun and I hope it wasn't too torturous for you. No, it was awesome. I had a great time. And like I said, I, I really appreciate you considering me for this. I've, I've heard many great interviews that you've done and I've always kind of wanted to do it. And I just, I think it's a really cool thing. So I appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much to Joseph for a great conversation. Go to SavvyPainter.com for show notes on this episode and to see Joseph's paintings. While you're there, make sure you don't miss an episode of the podcast. Sign up for show updates and free guides at SavvyPainter.com. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop, so you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening.